Zerith Ungel from Ventura, California was formed in 1971 by high school kids who'd been playing in a band called Titanic. Multi-instrumentalist Greg Lindstrom, drummer Robert Garvin, and guitarist Jerry Fogel broke away from Titanic's fourth member, Patrick Galligan, to play heavier music. They'd take the name Sirith Ungle from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, a mispronunciation of an elvish word which translates to spider's cleft, or pass of the spider. They'd begin to play heavier covers and eventually originals, with Greg on bass and a high school friend named Neil Beatty on vocals. But Neil didn't exactly fit the sound they were looking for, so he'd leave, and the band would spend a few more years figuring out their vocalist situation. On their 1978 demo, also known as the Orange Album, four different vocalists are featured, including Rob Garvin on a total of three tracks. It's fairly different from the sound they'd be known for later, with more of a Stooges vibe here. Although the Sirith Ungle energy and aggression is there, along with Jerry Fogel's unique guitar tone. Greg Lindstrom's vocals can also be heard on two tracks, including Bite of the Worm. Along with handling bass, Greg would also switch off lead guitar duties with Jerry, leading to some awesome jammy sections between both guitarists, which are the real highlights of the demo to me. Original singer Neil Beatty even makes an appearance on one track, We Know You're Out There. The fourth vocalist featured was, at the time, the band's head roadie. Tim Baker. Racing, racing in such a game we all play. If you can't take it, baby, do not enter wrong way. With the shoddy production, none of the vocalists really stand out all that much, but Tim still sounds relatively good here, although quite a bit different from how he'd sound on later albums. The overall songwriting is a bit underwhelming at this point, but there are several very cool jammy sections that are perhaps a result of their time spent playing without a singer. Other four tracks on the demo are all instrumentals of varying quality, including an instrumental version of the excellent Atom Smasher, but we'll get to that later. My favorite of these four though, and probably my favorite track on the demo, is Wit Sucker.
by the following year, Tim would be the full-time singer for Sirithungal, and they'd record a second demo with him as frontman. And it does show some improvement from the first, with some pretty cool stuff on it, like a badass synth version of Frost and Fire. Tales and speak of Frost and Fire, the past one stream and the fire divine. Frost preserves and the fire will destroy us like pouring rain on the sands of time. And I feel it burning, and I feel the freeze. I'm already a fan of the album version of this track, but this was a cool surprise. And we also get a better look at Tim on vocals here, who still hasn't reached his full banshee screech quite yet, but is clearly a great fit for the music. Making the scene with all the hangers on. Well, kissing some ass. And just to show we were long. If you do it right. He only appears on half of the demo though, with five instrumentals taking up the other half. Of these, Darkness Weaves is the standout for me, with the cool guitar and synth combo. meander somewhat and doesn't really sound like the band's later stuff, but this is still a great example of Sirith Ungle's versatility, especially with its bridge section, which has a kind of proggy ballad vibe. this time, the band was joined by bassist Michael Flint Vujea for live shows so Greg and Jerry could play double lead guitars, although Greg would remain on bass as Sirith Ungle began recording what was intended to be just another demo. However, they'd hear about a distribution company called Green World through future Metal Blade CEO Brian Slagle and decide to put the album out as a proper release. To do this, they created their own record label, Liquid Flames Records, which released Frost and Fire in 1981. Not only does it have some fun tracks on it, Frost and Fire also has an excellent cover, featuring the Michael Moorcock character, Elric of Melnibene. I was reading Stormbringer by Michael Moorcock at the time and was thinking, man, this is the ultimate cover art. I never thought we could use it, but I contacted the publisher who got me in touch with Michael Whelan, who is one of the few people in our entire music career who was honest, friendly, and kind, and we got to use it. I think we were the first album cover he had done at the time, and we really wanted to use his Elric series on all our covers, which we did. The songs included on Frost and Fire were mainly selected based on what the band thought would get radio airplay, so it is on the lighter side compared to later Sirith Ungle stuff. There's definitely a heaviness to this album, but much of it is still operating under more of a 70s approach. So, the first three tracks in particular are headbangers and great examples of early American heavy metal. A 
Eternal Fire is another personal favorite, even though it is on the slower side, but it's heavy as hell and the bass sounds great. The rest of the album is a bit more varied, including the more new wavy track, What Does It Take, which also features more synth. and the punk-adjacent Edge of a Knife. I still like most of these, but I can see how the lighter tone and more simplistic tracks may turn off certain listeners looking for heavier, darker material. And I think it's fair to say that Tim's vocals won't be everyone's cup of tea, but I love unique singers, and overall, Tim sounds great to me here. While Greg Lindstrom had written every song on Frost and Fire, he'd decide to leave once the album was recorded. Greg left to pursue an engineering career and is presently living in Los Angeles. It's not what we wanted, but it happened. When Greg left, we lost a lot. However, we've learned to work together more and not to rely too much on one person. Greg chose engineering and we chose heavy metal. I felt I had reached a turning point in my life after graduating college and spending 10 years in the band. It was more than a year after Frost and Fire had been released, and sales were decent, but nothing was really happening for us, and I felt it was time to move on, which I did with much regret. In 1982, Brian Slagle would launch his label, Metal Blade Records, and include Sirith Ungle on his first release a compilation of unsigned bands called Metal Massacre. Brian wanted Sirith Ungle to be on Metal Blade, but Green World Distribution had morphed into Enigma Records and gave them a deal for the second album. And since the commercial angle hadn't worked like they'd hoped, the band decided to go as heavy as possible for this one. Frost and Fire was our attempt to get a major record label and radio support. We had put our most accessible songs on that album, and when we received little recognition, we decided to pull out all the stops and create the heaviest album we could. King of the Dead, I think they totally succeeded with an album full of heavy, classic tracks. That said, I don't think Sirith Ungle is necessarily an easy band to just jump into, and it may require a couple listens to really appreciate. But with King of the Dead, they solidify their sound with a mixture of heavy, epic, and doomy riffs. Come on and ride. The 
Featuring another Elric painting by Michael Whelan, also titled King of the Dead, the songwriting on this album is far more elaborate and complex than that found on the majority of Frost and Fire. And we get some amazing lengthy guitar solos from Jerry throughout the album. The Dead was our best album. The reason was that we had total control over it. Every album could have been this good if we could have exercised complete control over its production and other things. This is the album which I feel is our best effort. King of the Dead definitely feels focused with a dark, epic atmosphere, and in hindsight stands as one of the greatest doom metal albums of the 80s. But it was a bit of an oddity in 1984 going up against poppier releases like Rats Out of the Cellar, Wasp's self-titled album, and of course, Van Halen's 1984, which was a stark contrast to Sirith Ungle's less flashy, 70s-influenced vibe and their tendency to explore more progressive aspects of their sound. but it's still all built around an overall heaviness and dread-filled aesthetic, showcasing slow, groovy riffs that are easy to just get lost in. For me, Tim's unusual vocal delivery adds another layer of powerful darkness and has always sounded to me like some ghostly creature singing in a crypt or cemetery somewhere. Like I said, every track on here is pretty great, and the second half is just as enjoyable as the first, including an instrumental cover of Box Toccata in D, and the longest track off the album, the epic Finger of Scorn. Thungle would move over to Metal Blade for their third album, One Foot in Hell, released in 1986. It's a lot different from our last one, obviously. Just listen to the songs. It's so much faster, better, and ballsier. 
I think on our last album, we were too kinda eccentric. Like it was too different for people to handle. But the new one is pretty consistent. This is another overall great album, and it definitely embraces the 80s sound more than Sirith Ungle's previous releases, like in the opener, Blood and Iron. But the 70s influence isn't gone entirely, showing up in tracks like the Black Sabbathy Doomed Planet. From a Doom perspective, I personally gotta go with Chaos Descends. Chaos Descends! Chaos Descends! Chaos Descends! Chaos Descends! Chaos Not only has a great sludgy riff, but it also eventually goes into a very cool speedier bridge. However, it seems like the band felt that the album could have been even better if the label hadn't been so involved in its production. The problem with One Foot in Hell is that Brian Slagle, who owned Metal Blade Records, wanted to take a large role in the production of the album. I think this was the beginning of where the band started to lose control of our vision, and it's evident in this record. There were solos left out or changed, and multi-tiered vocals that were removed. I also did not like the final mix. Even so, I like this album a lot overall, although I do agree that it doesn't quite reach the level of King of the Dead, but it has some standout tracks on it as well as some of Jerry Fogel's best guitar work. Unfortunately though, Jerry would decide to leave the band after finishing One Foot in Hell. We had found a really good guitarist named Jimmy Barraza, who we wanted to bring on board so that Jerry could concentrate on his leads, and we could play all the double leads we were writing. Somehow, Jerry must have felt that we were trying to replace him, although nothing could have been further from the truth. Not long after being joined by Jim Barraza, Flint would decide to leave Sarathungal as well. I showed up at the band room one night and Flint's stuff was missing. He had decided to join a garage band thinking that our career was doomed. After six months, he returned only to leave again right as soon as the album was about to be recorded. At the last minute, Sirith Ungle would be joined by second guitarist Joe Malatesta and bassist Robert L. Warrenberg. Not happy with Metal Blade, Sirith Uncle would move over to Restless Records, where they'd release their fourth album, Paradise Lost, in 1991.
While Paradise Lost on one hand is a bit of a mess, it also has some freaking great stuff on it. Yeah, come on. There's an alright cover of Arthur Brown's Fire, and each of the new members were also allowed to include one of their own songs on the album. Joe Malatesta's entry was The Troll, another groove metal track, while Robert Warrenberg contributed the more galloping, power-focused track, Heaven Help Us, showcasing possibly Tim's cleanest vocals. And there's also a cover of a track from Jim Barraza's previous band, which is easily the glammiest song Sirith Ungles ever released. Don't need no crystal ball to show me where I'm going. wildly different from the rest of the album, and I'd say anything else Sirith Ungle has done, but even so, it absolutely rocks. Well, I was born with a But where this album really shines is in the last three tracks, which are all excellent. I like a lot of this album overall, but the last third is awesome, with the Judas Priesty Fallen Idols and the utterly fantastic title track. Jim Barraza's guitar playing is great throughout the album, laying in some fiery solos. I can only speak on the remastered version of the album, which came out in 2016, somewhat ironically on Metal Blade Records, as the original 1991 release on Restless was a major disappointment to the band. Paradise Lost was like a nightmare I have never awakened from. We were totally screwed by the record company and the producer took away all of the control. The sad part of the whole sordid affair is that Restless never meant to do anything to promote the record at all. So I think if we could have made the album the way we wanted, it probably would have been more successful and we would still be together today. Joe Malatesta and Robert Warrenberg left before the album was even released, which led to a brief inclusion of Vernon Green on bass. But he'd leave as well after the band got dropped by Restless, and Jim Barraza would follow soon after. Sirith Ungle would remain disbanded for 25 years until 2016 when Jarvis Leatherby, 
heavy metal promoter and singer bassist for Night Demon, was finally able to convince the very reluctant group, including original member Greg Lindstrom, to reunite for the Frost and Fire Festival in Ventura, California. Sadly, the remaining original member, Jerry Fogel, had passed away in 1998 from liver failure. For Frost and Fire 1 in 2015, Sirith Ungle only appeared for a meet and greet and autograph signing along with Flint, but in 2016 at Frost and Fire 2, they would actually play for the first time in 25 years with Greg Lindstrom, Robert Garvin, Tim Baker, Jim Barraza, and Jarvis Leatherby on bass. Then in 2018, this same lineup would release the single, Witch's Game. While this artwork is also by Michael Whelan, it's actually from Stephen King's Dark Tower series, and would be Sirith Ungle's first cover not to feature Elric of Melnibene. However, Elric would return for their fifth album, Forever Black, released in 2020. Back on Metal Blade Records, Forever Black overall is pretty good. We need you from darkness to stand by our side. Live in the ride. Live in the Every band's music evolves over the years and between albums, but we wanted to try to pick up right from where we left off after Paradise Lost and create an album of all new material, but to stay true to our original vision of the heaviest metal known to man. It's a bit more straightforward and conventional compared to their first couple albums, but it achieves what it sets out to do with a combination of power and darkness. Much like their earlier albums, this one gets better the more I listen to it, but I'd still put it below King of the Dead and One Foot in Hell, although a lot of it comes pretty damn close. However, the guitar playing from both Jim Barraza and Greg Lindstrom is always excellent and a highlight of pretty much every track. But again, it's a very easy album to listen to, and if nothing else, it's just nice to see the band back and sounding great, including Tim's vocals. While Forever Black is Sirith Ungle's most recent album, they also released a great EP in 2021 titled Half Past Human.
decided to breathe new life into a few songs with a similar beast-like theme and really pump them up and make them extra heavy. Many have misunderstood what this EP is. These are not new songs, but some of our earliest material, written from 1975 to 1977. tracks on here rock, and overall there's more of an 80s feel than 70s, but regardless, it's distinctly Sirith Ungle, and it makes me super excited for whatever they do next. We are currently working on what will be our doom-laden, ultra-heavy 6th studio album, to be released in 2023 on Metal Blade Records. The songs were written during the pandemic, and the cover will feature another masterpiece by Michael Whelan. Sounds awesome! Until then, here is your Sirith Ungle homework. Frost and Fire is a bit uneven and has some odd stuff on it, but it's still a must-listen album. However, King of the Dead and One Foot in Hell are the two ultimate Sirith Ungle releases in my opinion. Paradise Lost is even more of a mixed bag than Frost and Fire, but the good stuff on it is freaking excellent. And Forever Black didn't blow me away, but it's still super solid, and if you dig the other albums, you should give it a try too. For extra credit, don't miss out on Half Past Human, a really fun EP with some updated older tracks. And that's Sirith Ungle. I hope you enjoyed this look back at a criminally underrated band who are finally starting to get some overdue recognition. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. Yeah.